Welcome to the Scalar Learning Podcast, your central hub for all things related to education. Join us every episode for the most up-to-date tips and strategies on how to maximize student potential. Sit back, listen, and enjoy. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Scalar Learning Podcast. I am super excited for the show today for a number of reasons. One, it is my birthday today or the day that it's going to air, June 17th. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm looking forward to celebrating for the day and for the weekend. So that's pretty cool. But I'm more excited for another reason And the reason why I'm so excited is because I have a really incredible guest on the show today, and we are going to be talking about technology and education, and really we're going to be highlighting the perils of video games and social media with respect to child development, engagement, self-control, etc. Now, just to give you a little explanation as to why I think this is such a cool episode is because, to be honest... Prior to reading uh, this book that I read just the last weekend, which is called Wired Child, and we're speaking to the author today, prior to reading that, I hadn't really looked into this issue too much. And I'm still trying to read more and learn more, talk to more people. So uh, this is going to be great for me because I have a lot of questions and I want to talk about a lot of different things that I read about in the book with the author, so I can't wait. And... I hopefully for parents out there listening, you can take this information and it's not only just going to be information, it's going to be how to apply the information, tips, strategies, etc. to make sure that the technology that you are exposing your kids to is going to be beneficial, helpful, and it's not going to impede their development. So let me give a quick introduction for my guest today, Dr. Richard Freed. So again, his book is called Wired Child, and Dr. Freed is a child and adolescent psychologist and the author, again, of Wired Child, Reclaiming Childhood in a Digital Age. He completed his professional training at Cambridge Hospital Harvard Medical School and the California School of Professional Psychology. Dr. Freed is a contributor to the Huffington Post and is on the advisory board of Families Managing Media. He lives in Walnut Creek, California with his wife and two daughters. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Freed to the show. Dr. Freed, how's it going? Um, very good, Hussefa. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got a very busy schedule and I am super excited. So also, let me just tell you the... the the way I came about the idea, or the reason why I reached out to you and wanted you on is because, quite frankly, so I, I tutor a lot of kids. I'm also going to be teaching next year. I've been substitute teaching for fourth grade for the last four months. And I have a lot of parents that ask me or that vocalize to me that they have concerns about their children's use of video games. And I used to more or less say it's not a, it's not a huge deal. I didn't really think about it. And the reason why is because I played video games growing up. I didn't start as young as kids are now. I think we got our first Nintendo when I was around 10 or 11. But I remember I I really loved them. I was super into them. And then I just lost interest at some point in college. I don't know why. So I guess my thought has always been, you know, why what's it's it's probably going to happen naturally like that. But that's obviously not the case. I better understand that now after after reading your book. So that's that's kind of why I, I really wanted to have you on here. So let's start off like this. Can you first tell everybody out there listening, why do psychiatrists, psychologists, why is there this comparison oftentimes between substance abuse for different substances and video games, video game addiction? I think what we're realizing uh, recently is that addiction is less about a substance and more about the brain. It's, it's not just uh, that a person uses cocaine or alcohol. It's the fact that that co- cocaine or alcohol affects the brain. And what we're actually finding is what's been remarkable is brain scan technologies like PET scans and uh, functional MRIs. When we put a person into one of those brain scans and they have, let's say, a gaming addiction or a uh, gambling addiction, that their brains really look remarkably similar to a person who has a substance addiction. So we're really moving away from 
a substance model and now thinking about uh, addiction as, as how it impacts the brain. Can you, is there, can you draw a comparison with respect to video game addiction? And I guess maybe, I don't know if it varies from person to person, but I mean, how strong can it be when you're comparing it to these higher level narcotics? Or I understand even sugar has some serious addictive properties. How would you compare those? Right now, I think we're looking at the two, the two ad- ad- addictive behaviors are uh, gambling, which was just actually, just most recently in 2013, actually made an official addiction. And it just kind of shows you how slowly the wheels of U.S. psychiatry are turning to sort of get there because, wow, how long have we sort of commonly known that gambling could be addictive? But it was finally uh, recognized in 2013. And then so gambling's one, and then gaming um, would be the other. And then uh, that, and, but gaming is not officially yet recognized as, as an addiction. It was put in in the psychiatric guidebook, the chief one, in 2013, uh, not as a full diagnosis, but one that needs more research before it's fully accepted. So we're getting there. But as far as what are the effects, I mean, um, you really don't have 10, 11-year-old, 12-year-old kids getting into uh, alcohol or methamphetamine so it's it's sort of hard to make uh, that that uh, comparison directly relatable. But as far as let's say like a 12 year old kid that is addicted to um, gaming, uh, that I would see, I mean, it really meets the the profile that you would see for someone who's addicted. And I think parents are going to either know this themselves or talk with relatives or friends. We're talking about kids that do some really profound things when parents try to set even just modest limits. We're talking about kids who will threaten to uh, kill themselves, take a chair and uh, throw it through a window, put their fist through a wall. Uh, we're talking about kids as they get bigger to get up in parents' faces and, and these are and, and, and intimidate parents. We're talking about formally well-behaved, not antisocial, uh, you know, kind of great kids that happen to get into gaming and then uh, overuse it, and it really changes them. And that's where we see it affecting the brain, and that's why we are moving towards, in my belief, considering calling it an uh, an addiction. I remember in, in your book you have some pretty pretty graphic examples that were, that, were in, that were in the media of kids doing pretty atrocious things uh, to their parents or family members as a result of being deprived of, of video games. I guess how common is it for these for these bursts of anger, the, like the, the, what you did, the more common ones, I'd say uh, there's some in your book I don't even want to get into because they're, they're pretty bad stories, but the ones where, you, where you're saying, hey, punch a hole in the wall, threaten their parents, these types of outbursts, how common is that? You know, we're look, we're try, this is all pretty new, but we're really looking at, any, and it's still a pretty wide range, but some people will say as low as 3% of gamers are addicted and some people will go as high as 11%. So it's it's somewhere in there, and you know a lot of parents are sadly, and, and it's understandably, but giving up on trying to treat their game addicted kids. You have we have a a group of many sort of kids turning eighteen, nineteen, twenty, young adults who are living at home and not moving on. And when you talk with these parents, you'll talk and you'll say, well, my. Uh, boys are more uh, tend to be more addicted than girls, but it's my son who you know hasn't. He's capable, but he's not moving on. He's stuck in his room gaming. So th- these are parents who aren't setting limits, uh, and maybe they tried, and the kid became aggressive, so they've really given up on it. So I would say in my practice, I, I, I it's like, and we're talking again, three to eleven percent of young gamers. I think that sort of that would fit with what I see. In my practice, I work with a group of uh, child and family clinicians, and it really, you know, up and down the hall, they, they know that I study and talk and, and write about kids' tech, and I hear about it every day uh, from the clinicians that I work with. It, it, it cuts through, um, and we're t- talking not just addiction, but we're talking about kids that, let's say, if they're not just quite addicted, that they've given up on school, that they, uh, or, or they've uh, they're, they're not getting outside or they're, they've become depressed because they've, you know, is that a full addiction? I'm not quite sure, but it, it really cuts through a, a lot of the different problems that, that kids have. So you mentioned briefly that boys are more susceptible 
than girls. I know you talk about in the book. Can you explain a little bit as to why that is the case? I think we're trying to get our hands around that. Boys tend to have more problems with addiction in general, whether it's gambling or uh, a substance addiction. I, there's a powerful reward-based neurotransmitter in our brains called dopamine, and there's newer research suggesting that when an, a, a male picks up or a, a boy or a young adult picks up uh, that's a male picks up a, a substance that they get more of a high, they get more of that dopamine kick than a female. And really interestingly, research out of Stanford shows that uh, young males, when they uh, game, that their reward-based pathway that really is based off that dopamine lights up in a, in a much more significant way as compared with, uh, with, with females. So boys are really getting, uh, they're, they're more likely to be addicted by statistics and then when we peer into their brains, we're seeing that their brains are really much more affected by gaming uh, than girls. Wow. All right. I want to chat now about why you think video games in particular are so addictive. Because you, you hit this point in, in Wired Child where you, where you mentioned basically, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there was a guy who wrote a paper on, on basically how to engineer games to be exactly that to be addictive so that people didn't want to pl- put them down they kept wanting to play them and then he i think he was eventually you said hired by microsoft correct okay so can you t- can you tell us a little bit about this gentleman i i just i, I want to say that you would think you know as a parent that the, the person the people who are developing games that kids are going to play would be uh, uh computer programmers but increasingly, games are being put together by those who traditionally have studied uh, rats in mazes and, and run uh, and, put, and studied humans in, in labs. And those are, uh, the, the gaming industry is increasingly looking to neuroscientists and psychologists to, to develop their games because really they understand how the human mind uh, works and ticks, and, and they can develop products that are remarkably sticky um, and uh, that, that kids don't want to put down. And in, in my book, Wire Child, I do mention John Hobson, who uh, was hired by Microsoft and has a, a degree from uh, Duke University, I believe, in, uh, in, in cognitive science. And he wrote, uh, before he was hired at Microsoft, wrote this really important paper in the gaming industry called uh, Behavioral Game Design, in which he really said, you know, this is not to say that players are the uh, the same as rats, but that there are general rules of learning which apply equally uh, to both. And what you're going to find in, in the gaming industry is, is that there are uh, people like uh, Dr. Fulton and um, or, or Dr. Hobson, and then there's another uh, there's Bill Fulton who is is, a, is another uh, he worked for Microsoft, and he really comes out saying that that he talks about the intention of, uh, he started Microsoft's games user research uh, department, and he talks about uh, what is the intention of, of game designers today. And really, this is one of the most troubling things that I found in, in my research and in my book, but, and I don't think this is really meant for parents to hear, but what he said is that the intention of, of game designers is really to take all the voluntary activities that that someone has, and to to replace them by the the products that, that that these game designers are making to replace them by games, and I really, if parents are wondering why they are losing their kids or why their kids are growing less interested in school or less interested in spending time with family and uh, just more comfortable with spending their lives in their rooms gaming or sitting there on their phones gaming, I, I really think we have to look to what is the, the purpose and who is behind making these very powerful games that our kids are using. So when, when you say replace, I think you, you said replace voluntary activities. Do you, is that, you mean that the video game designers are trying to, or this gentleman at least in particular, is trying to get kids to choose video games over like extracurriculars or other activities like that? 
Yeah, you know what Mr. Fulton uh, said is, and he he wasn't speaking directly to uh, the development of of games for kids. He was talking about game development in 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 general, in my understanding. And he really talked about just pulling uh, uh, people away from voluntary uh, social activities or hobbies or pastimes or, or their their pastimes. And when I talk with parents, when I talk at schools and conferences. I turn to parents and I say, you know, what are, and, and I talk to physicians too, but like, you know, what's a voluntary activity for a child? And everybody will kind, kind of say, well, you know, trying in school or putting effort into homework or, um, and, 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 and Josefa, you know, you talked about how, well, you played games when, when you were younger. I think, I, I, I'm awfully sure that the games that you were playing are not as, as powerful as the ones that are being developed today by these by these brain researchers who are putting games together for the express purpose, in my mind, uh, to, to like I said, to pull people away. I don't think that they have that level of technology they, to to bring those games to um, people today. So yes, the games that you played were probably uh, more harmless, and you could play them, and you could put them down, and you went off uh, to school and and to do well. It's you know, I, I I really see, sadly, too many very capable kids today not being able to move away, not being able to uh, to, to move on with their lives in spite of the best efforts of, of parents. So I think some of that is really coming from the advanced technologies that and the and the brain researchers and the and the people researchers that are now developing uh, the games that kids use. So what are now? I I also have. I know you mentioned in your book that you think it's a potentially bad idea to reward basically reward school related tasks or other productive things with video game time can you tell can you explain to the audience exactly why you feel that way or what are the what are the negative aspects of doing that sure uh this is one of the most commonly misunderstood elements even amongst uh psychologists they really um, we, we don't get this right, and you're going to, or or people that you're that parents are going to commonly find on the internet. They're, you're going to see a lot of people who uh, just mistakenly say they they don't mean to, to 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 make this mistake, but they say, you know, oh, if you have a kid that um, that doesn't really want to do school, promise them game time for or getting things done, and or and, and or let's say, okay, if you get such and such grade or bring your thing up, we'll. We'll get you a phone. All these things uh, are what are known as extrinsic rewards. And video gaming would be one. Promising kids money for uh, a certain grade would be another. And what is really challenging is ext- extrinsic uh, motivation really looks like it works. You know, if parents promise these things, it sure looks like it gets kids to sit down and to, and to okay, I'll do it, you know. But what and so it, it really looks to parents like it's working. But what parents find is, is what the research shows is that a week down the line, uh, two weeks or a month or six months, that that extrinsic reward isn't working anymore, or they have to promise their kids even more game time for less schoolwork. And, and that process keeps going. And what is the most disturbing thing that we're finding about extrinsic rewards is that it diminishes kids' intrinsic, that's the opposite of the extrinsic reward, it diminishes their intrinsic motivation, their feeling inside that they want to do well. Um, and that's what we're really aiming to have kids find. That, And I know that's hard to find for kids. I was a busy boy. You know, it, kids don't take to, uh, especially boys sometimes don't necessarily take to school real uh, easily. There were a lot of things I sometimes probably would rather do as a grade schooler than sit down to do math or a, a middle schooler. Uh, but over time, if, if we have kids that aren't getting distracted or aren't, using, or aren't being exposed to uh, those extrinsic rewards, they're going to be more likely to find intrinsic motivation, that feeling in their heart that, wow, I, I, I could do this, or I, you know, I, I'm proud of myself for getting that math problem, or, wow, I kind of found studying American history interesting, or you know, I really want to do, I want to grow up to be a pilot, and what is a pilot need to do? Well, they need to do well in school. That's, those are all examples of an intrinsic motivation, and we want to have, uh, we want to work towards getting our kids to find that intrinsic motivation. And 
one of the key elements of that, and, and disturbingly in the research, is extrinsic rewards like promising video games hurt that intrinsic motivation. They, 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 they chip away at it. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. For me as an educator and even as a private tutor, I often try to help kids find intrinsic motivation in a few different ways, I guess. One, hoping that my enthusiasm for different subjects will rub off. Two, trying to show them real-world applications of math and otherwise help them look at different ways that they can channel their, their skills to, to make things that they can look back and say, like, wow, this is really cool. But I'd love to hear, do you have any additional advice or any other methodologies that you like to use or you advise parents to use to help their kids find that intrinsic motivation if they haven't yet? Jose, if I really like your, uh, you know, helping kids see how, like, what's in it for me? You know, why, uh, um, why would I be doing this? I think that that's really great. Um, I, I suggest parents, uh, you know, a lot of times if, if parents are interested or families are, are believing that their kid's going to go to college, uh, to not wait uh, to, to sort of understand what college is and uh, don't wait until a kid's junior year or senior year to sort of think about what college is, especially if you had kind of a, a gaming-focused kid or a busy kid. Uh, not that you would go visit colleges with the, with the express purpose of um, saying you've got to get here or this is what you have to do, but just to go walk around a college campus uh, like a, a, a beautiful one and say, wow, this is kind of nice, and uh, kids look around, and they, you can eat in the commons, and, oh, I see what kids are doing here, and this seems kind of interesting, and I'd like to end up here, and then that some, sometimes can get them thinking, oh, you know, what do I need to do to get to college, and, uh, oh, that actually, they can go to a website, and they can take a look at uh, the College Board website or uh, the a school's website and see, well, geez, it takes that kind of uh, GPA to get into this school. I better sort of uh, work on that. So don't wait if, if you know, uh, visit colleges when kids are in later elementary school or in middle school or in the beginning of high school before kids get really sucked away by gaming and have them thinking about this is what I want to do or work towards uh, as, as I get older. Okay, awesome. I have to ask now about something that it's literally just a question that I have for myself. So we talk about, for example, gaming to the point where it becomes addictive. And and of course, uh, even me, myself and other educators, we always recommend instead, try to do things that are productive, like tennis, or maybe getting more involved in reading or and now for me, what I spend the majority of my time almost all of my time doing is working on on different things education related and I love it and some people tell me my girlfriend especially that sometimes they think that I I work too much or I spend too much time like thinking about ideas and I actually in a weird way feel I don't know if addicted is the right word but I feel just so compelled to constantly do stuff related to my work but, but, but I really find it really fun what is the difference or maybe there isn't a difference what is the difference between my behavior and me getting really into what I'm doing versus what would be called addictive with respect to video games or otherwise? Jose, that's a, a really good question. I, I, I think you want to look towards our, our past history, uh, like our long past history is, is, is growing up, um, let's say 50,000 years ago. You know, you might have been uh, t- taken with um, how to build a, a better spear or how to build a, a better bow and arrow uh, 50,000 years ago. And you might have worked on that uh, for a, a day or two or a week or a month at the expense of other things that maybe you, you might have, like, skipped meals or you might have do- missed some other element. But in that regard, you were working towards something productive that is going to advance um, – you and, and, and help the people you lived with. And, and so I, I really would look to that. I would look to, you know, are, is what people, are, are what people doing helping them in some way become a better person? Um, and, and, and I would suggest what you, the work that you're doing is. You feel uh, that, that that's an important thing for you and to, and to help others. And I would, it's just really sad to me to see how many remarkably 
gifted or, or and capable kids there are that have are that their primary purpose is is is, is to game and to and to gain uh, a higher higher and higher level and then they'll become 30 years old and and or even I have kids that are 18 and 19 and become depressed and sad and say like wow this this goal really hasn't got me anywhere or I feel like I, I'm not I haven't developed, and I, I'm, I'm not moving out of my parents' home. So I, I think that that is there's there's a big difference, and we're really only finding that there's two uh, addictive behaviors at, at this point. Uh, I, I, there's a chance that we might add others in, in the future, uh, for example, like a, a sexual addiction or or something of that sort. But at this point, we've really got uh, gambling, which we've fully acknowledged is is a, a behavioral addiction, and video gaming. Uh, slash certain internet activities that we've put in that that diagnostic and statistical manual. So I I would just also go by how just how addictive they are with respect to how much dopamine they are providing in your brain. And I think your the hard work that you do and the hard work that some other people do, you know, it gives you a a, a little bit of dopamine, but it's nothing compared with the uh, you know when when parents are looking to think of something that might be concerning. Uh, and they're wondering why people are getting stuck on on gaming. I don't think I've mentioned this, but uh, when we do brain research, we're finding that that video gaming triggers the release of that reward-based neurotransmitter dopamine at the same level as if someone got a shot of amphetamine. So when parents are saying, my kid's starting to get hooked or addicted or on, on gaming, it really looks to be true. And that's a different type of activity than what you describe for yourself. And is that, would, is, I assume that's the same can be said of sports. It's probably a, a vast difference as far as the dopamine levels for some of these games versus just athletic activity. I, I think that would be really interesting as we move forward with, with brain research to put people into uh, brain scans and have them perhaps envision the sport that they play um, and see what kind of level of dopamine, um, what kind of rewards that provides. But I, I'm awfully sure what we're going to come up with is just what we're seeing um, in, uh, in, in people's behavior, and that's representative of, of how much reward they're getting. You know, we see kids, uh, teens, getting stuck on drugs, so we know those are ad- addictive. And we see kids getting stuck on gaming. We don't really see them getting stuck on school or studying probably too much. I mean, up and down my floor, we have, uh, or the with the clinicians that I work with, we have a number of kids that the parents are needing to call uh, the police when parents uh, try to set even modest limits. We have kids being psychiatrically hospitalized because they threaten to kill themselves or somebody else when parents try to limit their phone use it uh, or, or video game use. I, I think that is representative of how much dopamine that, and how much how profoundly rewarding these games are as compared with typical real life activities that we do want people to engage in and become interested in so, so let's talk there's one other thing that that ties into this you talk about how rewarding it is the dopamine rush so can you tell us i know you mentioned this again in your book you talk about this actually in quite a bit of detail why does why then does gaming sometimes seem to have an effect on the ability basically uh, willpower, essentially the, the ability to stay focused uh, with, when it comes to school tasks, even when it comes to just reading. And you, I, think, I believe you say that those tasks start to be, feel boring. How, does that, how do those two relate? Well, well, research does show that the more time kids spend gaming or the more time that they spend watching high-action TV cartoons, the less self-control they have, the less ability they have to focus and pay attention. And I think what we're going to find and moving towards finding is that the, the brain is plastic, that it, it really can change. And if, it's like a muscle. And if, if we want kids to, to develop the skill, to be able to sit down and, and to work on a math worksheet, which is hard and challenging, and uh, you know, the reward might not come for uh, that day, or it might not, you know, you don't sort of get a uh, feel good about it for a few days. That is a remarkably different experience than the high action uh, gaming rewards where somebody's getting rewarded with points and levels um, over and over. They're really different experiences. And I see this in my practice. I see, uh, you'll, and a lot of people are seeing this today, you'll just see people who are kind of kid gamers 
who will just say, nothing is exciting for me. I can't enjoy anything. I can't try on anything. I don't, I don't have the mental stamina or the self-control to push myself uh, to, to, to do these, what they consider to be boring activities. And some people are going to argue, well, well, we need to make life more exciting. I'm sorry. You know, I, learning uh, uh, challenging activities that humans have always had to do, which is, you know, build shelter and find food and to, to, to do things of that sort, they aren't necessarily uh, filled with excitement. And today's activities, you know, I, I think you can find interest and fun in school, but, and, and there is love and enjoyment that kids can gain from doing math, but it's, it's not it's potentially not going to compare with the same type of rewards that they're going to get uh, from, from gaming. And my concern is that kids are gravitating or being pulled away from the real-life activities that they need to do by these remarkably uh, seductive uh, games. Can you tell people listening a little bit about how to identify or where, when behavior crosses into video game addiction that needs to be addressed. I know you list some symptom, symptoms and signs. Could you go ahead and do that for the listeners? Sure. Um, you know, anytime, uh, firstly, you want to go with safety. Any, anytime a kid uh, threatens to hurt themselves, uh, you know, I'm going to kill myself if you take away this game or I, I just can't stand it. I'm going to, you know, I can't live anymore. That's a, that's a, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a serious sign. That is a serious sign right there. Or if, if kids are become verbally aggressive with their parents or physically aggressive, if they become intimidating, those are signs of a, uh, a, of a serious problem uh, right there. And I would kind of skip to concerns that a kid has an addiction or at least an obsession at, at that point. And, uh, you know, other signs that, that you're going to see are kids that are preoccupied uh, with, with, with gaming. And uh, the symptoms that I'm going to discuss here are really similar to the same symptoms that someone has if they have a drug addiction. And why is that? Because drug addictions and gaming addictions have a remarkably similar effect on the brain. So it's understandable that the, how they're going to show in real life is really going to be about the same. But you're going to see kids preoccupied with gaming. Oh, I've, this game, this game, that. The fact that they have a math test uh, the next day really doesn't um, concern them all that much. You're going to see kids having withdrawal symptoms when parents try to set limits. And, and withdrawal symptoms, I mean kids getting irritable, uh, more angry. You know, a kid says, oh, come on, Mom, and that's not so big. But if a kid says, like, some serious curse words and kind of tosses stuff, then we know we're starting to have a problem. You're going to see kids demand to use more and more time, even though, they already spend an exorbitant amount of time doing so. You're going to see kids losing interest in uh, previous activities. You're going to have parents that have made repeated unsuccessful efforts to get kids to use less. Uh, you're going to see kids lie. Uh, you're going to see formally loving, honest kids become deceitful and lie to their parents. Oh, yes, my homework's done when uh, they just want to get to more uh, game time. You're going to see kids wake up at five in the morning and, and sneak gaming that way. You're going to, parents are going to put away the computer or take away the, the tablet computer and you're going to see kids, somehow they ended up getting another computer or another tablet. Um, and lastly, because of all these problems, you're going to oftentimes see problems in uh, really a lot of conflict in the family and you're going to see kids not do as well in school. And those are a lot of symptoms and, you know, if the, the more of those symptoms that a, a kid has, uh, the more likely that they have an obsession or what I would consider uh, to be an addiction. I don't know that much. As far, I mean, I, I'm not a, a psychologist, psychiatrist. From, from the little I know or have at least read about addiction, I've heard anyways this idea that if you try to intervene, I'm t well, I'm more talking about narcotic addictions, but if, if people outside try to intervene, there's only so much they can do and that the the key to recovery ends up actually, I guess, becoming mo motivation from the person themselves where they finally say, I don't want to do this anymore, and they're able to stop whatever the, the compulsive behavior is and then recover. Is, that, is there some element of that that exists with video game addiction in the sense that 
are is attempting to intervene only really helpful or only becomes helpful after a certain point of recognition within the child who has the addiction himself or herself? Josefa, that is a, a wonderful question that we are really trying to sort through and that we all struggle with. Because as you say, um, for an adult that has a narcotic addiction, like let's say you're, you're, what you're looking for from them is for them to hit rock bottom and for them to gain insight that they've got a problem. Um, un- understandably, with parents and kids with, with gaming, kids really don't ever hit rock bottom. Kids, by rock bottom, you, you're, you've lost your job. Let's say as a narcotic addiction, you've lost your job. You um, don't have any money whatsoever. You've lost your wife or your girlfriend. Um, for a gaming addiction, kids can sit there and game in their room, and and they're happy as can be. Um, what at what point can they actually do? They actually hit rock bottom. They still have parents putting taking care of them, which parents need to do. So that is really hard for kids, and and also kids don't have a, as a developed of a prefrontal cortex that key judgment area that's going to give them the big picture and say, wow, I really have messed up my life, and I. And it, it, you know, I am failing school, so it's such a challenge, and and um, a lot of us are finding it is really tough to treat kids once they have become game addicted. Uh, there are actually um, centers, you know, China and South Korea, uh, in contrast to the United States and Japan, recognize video game addiction, and China and South Korea have hundreds of treatment centers for youth to address this problem, where kids are taken away. From their families, and in the United States, there's more. Um, there's more of that. A lot of the residential treatment programs that used to treat kids' drug addiction are now treating video game addiction. If parents want to look up for that on the internet, but uh, you know those prob- those 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 programs, you know, we're just now seeing uh, uh, them pop up. Are they going to be helpful? I'm 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 hoping so. What I really strongly suggest all this to me though is is I suggest parents. And we don't recognize this in America, but put much more emphasis on preventing this problem before it starts. Because, you know, I have so many parents who uh, say we're going to do our best with moderation and balance, and uh, but they don't understand how powerful and addictive these games are. And once problems get rolling with with children, it is uh, and teens, it is remarkably difficult, oftentimes, to turn things around. I mean, I, I can do it sometimes. Uh, but it depends on the kid. I have an article on this uh, in the Huffington Post. Uh, just why I suggest strongly that we really move towards prevention um, rather than trying to sort through the quagmire and, and the, the, the pain which families go through when their kid becomes game addicted. What is the name of that article? Um, uh, oh, darn it. Can we search? Can uh, can you can listeners search on the Huffington Post for Richard Fried? And might it might it pop it, up? Um, yes, and I, I think I think it, the, the 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 title is what 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 one boy's story tells us about uh, video game addiction. Okay, so what I'm going to do for all the listeners out there, I'm going to search that article. I will find it and I will post the link in the show notes. So you can just go to scalarlearning.com and click on it and read it there. So we'll have it available for everybody. So you mentioned that, I, I know you mentioned that kids have, a, their prefrontal cortex isn't as developed and that makes them a bit more susceptible to game addiction. I know in your book you say generally... When is the best time to expose kids to video games? I know you said later is better, but if for parents out there who are wondering what's a good time, what do you recommend for age to, to uh, for exposure? Um, Jose, for that's a, a, a good question. I um, I have to acknowledge uh, because of the pain that I see families go through um, every day in my uh, clinical practice and, and working with families, I am admittedly more conservative with respect to recommending, uh, you know, my recommendations about gaming. I, you know, I, I wish I could say that there was a good age to have kids. The, the longer parents wait uh, before kids uh, get into games, the better. I, I really am troubled by uh, the increasing, you know, just handing kids games with, uh, through parents' phones when they're infants and toddlers and, and, and so forth. It, and uh, it's remarkable. These uh, remarkably young kids can sit there for hours doing that. I think that's a, a sign that we're headed for problems already. But, you know, I just want to say, if, 
I, I'm of the mind, if, if your child hasn't started gaming, consider for yourself as a family, is that something we want to introduce our kids to? It does, it, there's strong research that the more kids game, uh, the less well they do in school. Uh, there are, we just don't know which kids are you know, uh, going to become obsessed or uh, addicted with games. Is there any way that we can consider not introducing games? Do we, can we have a game-free uh, household? If, if that sounds too conservative or too strong for a family, maybe um, waiting uh, as, as long as, as possible that they can uh, envision before their kids game, and then when they do, uh, set strong limits on it. And, and then there's actually research to suggest if kids do start gaming that, you know, o- online shooters, uh, the online violent games are, are perhaps more addictive than things like racing games or sports games. I see. And one last thing I wanted to touch on, you do, you do stress the importance of family uh, over and over in your book and how that can really it, – it, that video game playing or even use of social media can de- – can, can sort of diminish those bonds between family members. And I know you have a, a family. You have two daughters. Can you, can you tell us about some of the strategies that you employ in your home to keep social media video games out of the main focus and instead have more family time or do more things with your, with your family? Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, this has been a, a great uh, in, interview for me because it really, uh, firstly, it, it shows, uh, Husefa, that you've done a, uh, you, you, you say that you aren't an expert with this, but you get your hands around it really uh, quickly. And then for me to also think about how it, uh, all, all these factors affect my life and then my family. But um, so this is, I feel like you've done a great job with this interview. But, um, you know, what I see, and I think we've gotten away from this in our modern-day society, we're told that kids, as they get older in, in present-day times, are, it's appropriate for kids to disappear uh, to their back rooms with devices and, and to leave their family. But I, that is such a modern-day uh, false construction. If, if we want to think about how families have always been raised, I suggest families go and we could look to consider what it was like for families in 1850 on the American uh, frontier, which is representative of how families have long struggled and the, the challenges that they've had to face against fighting against nature and so forth. How did those families live? Did, you know, were kids uh, disappearing to back rooms to engage with some sort of game or to disappear with peers and to do something online or something? Of course not. They were working and living alongside and laughing and sometimes crying alongside their families. And that's really what humans and, and, and kids need growing up. They, this, um, this whole idea that I, I really speak to in my book, which is there's this digital native, digital immigrant um, belief that we have in our society that kids are supposed to be more experts uh, with, with games because they've grown up around them or technology than their parents. That is a remarkably troubling and, and harmful falsehood. Parents need to... Uh, provide uh, direction and leadership. The parents have the, the prefrontal cortex and the wherewithal and the life experience to, to, to help kids make good decisions. And parents can understand how um, kids can, um, parents get how uh, they get the big picture, that kids spending lots of time gaming can really hurt them down the road. Kids can't do that. So that's where family comes in, that is, is an engaged, loving family uh, that spends less time with, with, with games and so forth, uh, that, that kids are going to be less inclined to feel uh, the need to, to seek out comfort. Because a lot of kids are doing that these days. They don't have time with their family, so they're going to seek uh, comfort. They're going to speak seek um, um, feeling whole and, and like a, uh, the, the, the things that they should be getting and need to be getting from their family, they're going to be looking to find those online or, or, or in, in video games. And if we just give them, if we raise kids amongst a really strong, loving family, uh, that, they can, that, that they're going to be less inclined to go feel the need to seek that out in games and social media. And I believe we, we see that at our house with our uh, two girls who are 9 and 13. And I know we have it easier with respect to gaming because, you know, our girls are, are, 
are, are going to be less inclined to game, but they are uh, inclined to surely start uh, texting and, and doing social media, which girls are more driven to do. But at this point, our uh, our 13 year old does not have. She has a phone, but she uses that phone to uh, contact us uh, when uh, she needs to get picked up from, let's say, lacrosse or something of, of that sort. But it's not. Uh, it, it doesn't have a data plan. Uh, she's not. It, she doesn't game on it. She doesn't use the phone at, at home. She just uses it outside of here, and and that is a strong limit to set. But uh, I I feel like that's the direction that I uh, those strong limits are really what our kids need, and that moving away from that digital native digital uh, uh, immigrant belief, we want to give our kids authoritative parenting, which is being loving, involved, but also uh, the second side of that is setting strong limits uh, on kids because that's what they need to grow up healthy and successful and to love and do well in school. Richard, Dr. Freed, thank you so much for joining us today. That This was awesome for me. This was uh, very educational. Hopefully everybody out there listening, it was great for you as well. Uh, Dr. Freed, if people want to get in touch with you or check out some of your other works, how can they – contact you or find more information about you uh they can go to my website at richard freed f-r-e-e-d dot com and uh i've got a uh they can see my uh, number of huffington post articles that i've written there uh information about my book and they can also uh contact me if they have uh any any, any questions through my website Okay, excellent. Now, I'll just say one more time. I mean, what, Wired Child is the name of the book. I read it this last weekend, and I loved it. I think it's it's great, and it's it's very well researched, and it's just awesome. So I, I would highly recommend it. And I'm going to do more reading on the topic over the next few months because it's it's quite frankly, it's interesting, and I think it's really important. So I will continue to read and research and uh, do episodes here and there on the topic as we go forward in the summer. So again, if you want to check out the show notes from today's episode, go to www.scalarlearning.com. And please, if you have not already done so, please subscribe to this podcast so you can get all the latest and greatest episodes and all things related to education, especially on mathematics. Again, this summer, we will be having episodes released every day. So make sure to check back very regularly for new episodes. This is Zefa signing off, and I'll see you guys next time. Take it easy.